Hype House for as little as $1 a month. You can support the best Miami Vice podcast on the internet. We promise we won't use the money to find a freezer tube in the Atlantic or fund bowl semen transactions. To see all the benefits of supporting us directly, including early show access or even a free mustache, head on over to patreon.com slash go with the heat. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season five, episode three, titled Heart of the Night. Every time in my head, I have to stop myself. And I'm like, is that heat of the night? Heart of the night. <laughs> I kept doing night. it too. Yeah, in fact, I had to scratch a little R in between the <laughs> uh, on my notes. <laughs> it originally premiered on November 18th, 1988. It is written by James Beckett. This is his only episode he wrote and will not be returning. We don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Paul Krasny, who also directed last week's Redemption in Blood. And this is his last one. Oh. <laughs> Before we get started, Chickens, who's going to tell his lives. Guys, speaking of only episode of this, and this is the last episode for this person on that. I have a season five request I need to ask everybody, not just the people here on this show, but the people who listen to this show. This is episode three of season five. Only 17 episodes aired on NBC and then four episodes later aired on USA. The question I have is for people who have never seen Miami Vice like me and John, should we watch it as it aired? Should we watch the first 16 episodes and then watch Freefall and then watch the four quote unquote lost episodes? Or watch the first 16 and then put the four lost ones in front of Freefall, which is the series finale, because that's how it was filmed in the studios. But then they shortened it, took out those four episodes and made Freefall the last one. How should we watch the final season of Miami Vice? Okay, so oh, for the first one, we watch it as it ran. And, and here's why. I watch a lot of TV, and I actually watch probably more USA shows than I watch NBC shows yeah. at this point. <laughs> I want to see, I want to be able to compare how uh, NBC and how they ended the run, and then I want to see if the episodes get better when they go to USA. <laughs> Now, to be clear, they did film them. They just decided not to air them. There's three of them that they decided yeah. not to air because they just shortened the season. And then there's the one that's the topic that no one likes to talk about is the one didn't that get got, aired anywhere right yeah, i didn't get aired anywhere until years later yeah well so, uh, since mm -hmm. i've seen them both ways because i own them now <laughs> <laughs> i think if, if you guys are watching it for the first time my opinion is that you should watch it the way that it was ran like mm -hmm. the way they aired it on it when you first watched it i'm gonna argue against that now let me just first say we want to hear from you so email us go with the heat at gmail.com let us know if you could go back in time how would you watch this series if you hadn't ever seen it before, would you change how you watched it versus when it ran versus how the show was originally set up? Because in my opinion, there's all like I've read a whole bunch of books where they've been I, they're not in sequential order. They are like three in a row, and then there's a prequel, and then there's one that's way in the future, and then there's ones that fill in the gap. For me, I'm a fan of reading it the way that you get it, not way way it was written, but in order in which things happen. And in the Lost episodes, things happen that don't make any sense after you see Freefall. Yeah, but, but I can't but, give I away mean, too much. But, uh, <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, uh. I, I, <laughs> Vice has been doing that to us from the very beginning with not <laughs> ending any of these storylines. We've been disappointed before. We've been confused before. <laughs> uh, I think let's just do it again. <laughs> so we're going to put this out to a vote. We have plenty of weeks to go. Like, you know, there's 14 weeks until we would get to free fall. So we want to hear from you. Email us go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what order should we watch this in. And speaking of way things get ordered, I have some Real strong feedback on this episode on the order in which things should have happened and what should have happened at the end of this episode. Let's go break down this week's. All right, when we open up, Castillo must be out on the dock in the speedo looking over the water. Oh, that's actually in Ecuador. I got my hopes up. <laughs> I thought that's the way this episode was going to start. <laughs> I will tell you though, Ecuador looks nice. I mean, I might have to make a trip down there. They're, they're pretty <laughs> fancy down there. Yeah, I thought that too. Very fancy, very tropical. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's a party, mm -hmm. military government party. So there's lots of people in like 
general uh, attire, as in like general of the military attire. <laughs> <laughs> Not just generic attire. <laughs> Masek gets stopped by Tony Dimitri, and they're old buddies. They're going back and forth, and Masek is there with Mei Ying. Now, hold on a second. Those names may sound familiar, because that is Mei Ying, as in Castillo's ex-wife, and her new husband, Masek, who a appeared in Golden Triangle Part 2, which I believe was in the first season? Yes, yes it is. See, I did, did not dawn on me. All this scene told me is that Dimitri wants to bone this guy's wife. <laughs> <laughs> Someone comes up to the microphone and announces, here's our new president, some guy that doesn't have a name. <laughs> We're not going to talk about his name, though. That's not important. <laughs> what gets me, though, is that as soon as they announce that the president's coming to the podium, a married couple kind of just look at each other and then they're like spooked for some reason and they run out and leave in their car real quick. I guess they didn't vote for him. <laughs> May says, I don't trust this country with this man running it, but... Ma Sek is looking at a man named Rivas. He's who, distracted. He sees make eye contact with him. He's clearly scared. He's like, okay, we got to go now. And she doesn't know what's going on. She just goes with it. They run and get in the car. They drive away. Another, sorry, two people come out of the back seat with masks and guns and then have Ma Sek drive the car out into the forest where they then get Ma Sek out and then put Ma Sing and Ma Ying in. May Ying in the car. This is going to be a fun episode. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> they put May Ying into the car, and it looks like they're going to rape her. So that guy's taking off his pants. That's what's yeah. going on there. Yeah, he's not trying too hard. He's, he's taking off. <laughs> I mean, I know he's, there's a gun, but he's just like, yeah. yelling, don't do that. Just don't do that. <laughs> yeah, well, and May Ying kicks her attacker off of her, and his instinct is to book it. Yeah. Run away. <laughs> Yeah, so she's left in the car to drive it, away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kudos to her. Like she manages to turn the car on, starts driving away. And I would have left his ass for running away like that, but she actually stops and picks him up. She runs over someone and then picks him up. Like saves his life before he's get before he gets shot. Yeah, remember all that for later in the episode. <laughs> All that stuff she was doing she, for that guy. She's too good for him. God. Ma gets in the car and they Benny Hill drive away. <laughs> it was really funny the driving. <laughs> it was like sped up. It was not sped up. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. This is our moment to stop and talk about the guest stars. And like I mentioned, Ma Sek and Mei Ying were both from season one in Golden Triangle. And of course, we know Vice. It's the same actors, right, John? Well, actually, Mei Ying is a different actor. Mei Sek, well, he didn't play Mei Sek in Golden Triangle Part 2, but he played Howie Wong. <laughs> <laughs> is that close enough? Like, does that count? <laughs> he was also remember. in a Makai episode called Golden <laughs> Triangle. So he was in two Golden Triangles. <laughs> I distinctly remember laughing about the name Howie, Howie Wong. Wong. Yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> yeah, I love that they could have got the same actor from that episode to play May Sack, but instead they got the guy that played Howie Wong. Like, no, 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 that guy was better. Let's have him play him. Okay, well, that kind of leads us into Ma Sack was played by James Sato. And, well, you might know him as, if you're about my age, you know him as Shredder in the 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. If you don't know him from that movie, no matter how old you are, shame on you. <laughs> Let's publicly shame him. <laughs> so, funny story. He played Shredder, but the voice of Shredder was dubbed over by David Mac Macharin. <laughs> So he played Shredder, but he wasn't allowed to speak. So he also appeared in uh, some pretty big movies. He appeared in The Devil's Advocate, Home Alone 3, Pearl Harbor, and Die Hard with a Vengeance. Some of his uh, TV credits. So I already mentioned the MacGyver credit. He also appeared on MASH, which will be a theme. That <laughs> stars here. But he also starred as Dr. Chen in the ABC drama uh, Eli Stone. And he's actually going to be, he has an upcoming role in Marvel's Cloak and Dagger. Mei Ying, she's played by Rosalind Chow. And she's actually even more known than he was. She was best known for portraying Klinger's South Korean wife on two seasons of After MASH. And actually, it started in the final episode of MASH, 
when she first appeared, and that was actually Klinger's wedding to her, I, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that is also, by, just a side note, as a MASH fan, that is still the most watched sitcom episode of all time. <laughs> hey, it helps out when there's only like four channels. <laughs> You get extra yeah, viewers. Yeah. So I was actually, and, and I'm honest, I was, I did not know about After Mash, and so I kind of need to watch that. Another place you might know her from is 27 episodes as Kiko O'Brien on Star Trek: The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. So she was one of the characters that crossed over between both series. Damn. Her parents actually owned a pancake shop across from Disneyland. She even worked there as an international tour guide while she was trying to break out into acting. Some of her movies are The Joy Luck Club, What Dreams May Come, I Am Sam. Damn. And our next guest star is Michael Lombard, who plays Malcolm Gray. He's been in a few movies, no real gigantic roles, but some crossover. So he was in Crocodile Dundee, he was in Pet Cemetery, he was in... The Devil's Advocate, as well as James Sado. So, uh, Rounders, The Thomas Crown Affair. So, some pretty good movies. Our last guest star is Bob Goonton, who plays Revis. He is known uh, for some pretty notable roles. He played Warden Norton in The Shawshank Redemption in 94. He was Chief Early in the 93 uh, hit Demolition Man. Oh, yeah, okay. And now you're like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, not <laughs> Shawshank Redemption, or whatever. Demolition Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he also played Doctor Walcott, the Dean in Patch Adams. He's actually been pretty successful as far as Broadway too. He was in the original Avita show. He was starred in Sweeney Todd, King of Hearts, Big River. He was also in Star Trek: The Next Generation. So it's the more crossover there. Damn. So, yeah, I mean, he was in Glory. He was in Born on the Fourth of July, JFK, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, uh, Broken Arrow. <laughs> That's quite a drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I think he's, he didn't want you to name that one. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of all of that, he served in the Army, 1969 to 1971. He earned a Bronze Star for Valor and the Vietnam Service Medal. Damn. So, yeah, pretty impressive dude. I did a quick check just to see, like, hey, what is there a connection here on The Devil's Advocate? We've seen this in guest stars where you find out later, like, Michael Mann was, like, a producer on something or something like that. There is no tie when it comes to Vice on here, but the movie is directed by Taylor Hackford. Now, Melissa, this is for you. Taylor Hackford also produced When We Were Kings, the Muhammad Ali movie. Yeah. Um, also directed and sorry, he produced La Bamba. Okay. <laughs> and he directed an officer and a gentleman. Oh my god, he's like my movie. <laughs> and against all odds. Oh my god, it is. <laughs> <laughs> all my movies in one thing. <laughs> well, when we come back from the opening credits we're back at the precinct, and there's Sonny just sitting at his desk, and here we go. Nothing like nothing ever happened, right? Wrong. Wrong. Yeah, and people people are making comments, man. You don't work here anymore. Man, you're, you should be in prison. Man, aren't you a murderer? <laughs> Gina even says you're here on a Sunday. No one ever sees you on a Sunday. Well, I mean, you haven't seen him in like a year, right? <laughs> Gina's just mad because he didn't remember sleeping with her. <laughs> that part hasn't come back yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying she wasn't in any of those flashbacks. Nope. Is that why she always kills the men? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of tubs, Melissa. Tubbs has had quite the change in wardrobe. Okay, I do not like this new wardrobe. It was like something like a businessman slash Indiana Jones. <laughs> he had like some ugly vest <laughs> on <laughs> with like dress pants. I mean, the beard's still there. I could still go with the beard. I think Crocodile Dundee like worked its way into yes. the vice. <laughs> something, I don't know. <laughs> Castillo comes over and he tells Sonny the charge should be brought against him for, all, you know, all the murders. All the murders. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the murders. I like how Sonny goes, I don't remember that. I don't remember those yeah, things. That's like, I, don't, I don't know what to say. Like, is that what yeah, you're going to use in court? I don't remember. Yeah, he's sticking to the, uh, I conveniently don't remember, therefore I'm not legally culpable for any of these murders. Also, when Castillo no, walked I over, love, it, 
it's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here? Yeah. That's the feeling you get when you stand there. Yeah, like, was, um, what are you doing here? <laughs> I was going to say, I love his reaction because he's basically like, just, just go home. Go home, you murderer. Because Sonny tries to say, I just want to stay and I want to work. Because he was like, that's cool, but you can't be here. Like, you got to go home. Take a break. Leave, and I'll call you. <laughs> Trust me. In a few days or so, everything will balance out. Don't worry. Just go on a fishing trip. Everything will be just fine. <laughs> go on a short vacation. <laughs> Foreshadowing. Castillo leaves and everyone's just staring at Sonny. <laughs> Sorry, but we all saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Tubbs. He's like, oh, I mean, come on. It's kind of true. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at Ecuador, I mean, the Castillo compound, which, I mean, I got it mixed up with Ecuador, but it suspiciously looks like the house of the rising sun of death. Not that Castillo would have anything to do with that. (laughs) (laughs) He probably got it for cheap after all those people were murdered. (laughs) Got a steal. His door's unlocked. He's suspicious, but not suspicious enough to call anyone or anything. Or take his gun out. Just no, go. no, I'm just going to like stalk around my house for a while. Yeah, I was going to say like, is is the house suspicious or is Castillo <laughs> just really creepy? <laughs> Castillo slinks around lo- looking for Elisa and Johnny. I mean, uh, wrong movie. The spiral staircase <laughs> every time gets me. <laughs> Cast- Castillo goes upstairs. He's starting to feel more danger and also slightly aroused. He's like getting upstairs. <laughs> and then he sees that May is there. And then the arousal was for a reason. <laughs> His temperament changes very quickly to, hey, baby. <laughs> Later downstairs, May is describing what happened in Ecuador, that they also took separate flights here to the U.S. because Ma Sek is scared for May. He wants to make sure that she's yeah. always away from him, thinking that Rivas is going to attack them again. And, of course, Melissa, the only person that can protect her in the whole world is... It's Castillo, because he's the only one that's a real man in her life. <laughs> She got the raw end of the deal when she married Ma, okay? Sorry. <laughs> but Castillo would have never let any of that thing, those things happen to her. He would have put a Speedo on and took care of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the wheels are turned. Castillo is forming a plan about how he's going to arrest Ma. <laughs> and he's going to win her back. Well, I mean, Ma makes it pretty easy. <laughs> it's going to start to go. Yeah, things are going to go according to plan pretty quick. She also didn't tell Mossack that she was going to see Castillo. So it's going to be some awkwardness in the future. Well, I mean, do you really tell your new husband that you're going to go see your pretended dead husband? <laughs> <laughs> now, Mossack, we actually spent most of our time during the scene debating what does Castillo do in his time <laughs> I, off? I just started thinking about it because he was going around that house. And it's like that giant house, right? He's got this big house to himself. But when is he ever there and what is he doing it? Does he like sit back? And have a beer and watch sports? No. And John, you've mentioned it several times. Castillo doesn't actually ever go home. No, no. He hangs out dark in the locker room so he can scare the janitor. <laughs> yeah, so why does he have that giant house? He's got this house, like this beautiful house. And Maybe like, that's why. I don't know. Maybe that's it. why he was so suspicious when he went inside. It's like, I don't remember it being this color. <laughs> I don't know. I just kept thinking, like, all the other characters in Miami Vice, you can think about what they go do, like, when when work's over. Like, Stan, he goes and has some pizza, maybe gambles a little bit, you know, (laughs) does magic tricks, you know, tubs, he does women. Does women and does women. (laughs) (laughs) Does women. Castillo do? And he doesn't apparently have a home. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. uh, But what does Castillo do? He goes home. This is the opposite. He has no home. (laughs) Yeah. Lives out of his Cadillac and other pe- in, in safe houses. Yeah. <laughs> These next few scenes are kind of uh, kind of strange. Customs doing a stakeout on what looks to be like a microwave warehouse, <laughs> and then we jump to Castillo and, and May in the car, and the most awkward conversation ever, where Castillo's like, "Hey, how's your son?" She's like, "He's dead." It's like <laughs> awkward silence. <laughs> I know it's so we, we, we've it's hard it's rough, dude. It's rough. <laughs> because we also know Sorry. when we saw their uh May and Ma's sex son in, in Golden Triangle, we were like, Are you sure? Are you sure this isn't Castillo Jr.? Yeah, and he still <laughs> asked her, he's like, Um, are is there any chance? She's like, No, it's not yours, but he looked just like him. Yeah, he's you've got a Marty haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and then you don't even call uh-huh. him and say his son. Well, <laughs> well, Castillo's son's gone the way of Tubbs Jr. <laughs> and then we jump back to the next scene, being the truck that the stakeout that they were watching, and these, these I guess, 
fake rent-a-cops. They've killed the driver, and they're digging through everything. And I guess they're disappointed because maybe I, I guess they thought they had, they had TVs. They were hauling TVs or something. <laughs> Why is everything packed in hay, though? <laughs> Hay and shredded newspaper. Because it's because they're glass it's birds. Shredded newspaper. They're glass. They're those birds that were in there. They're glass birds. So that's what it's like. Sh- we're gonna get to that. <laughs> we're gonna get to the the toy glass birds when we get to to that scene because that's strange enough. But yeah, they don't <laughs> find what they're looking for, and so yeah, it's like a strange sequence of these just like short, really cold, awkward yeah. scenes where we don't really under we don't get the full picture of what's going on. After all this weirdness kind of happens, we settle on at the embassy suites. Not gonna get any less yes. awkward here. May and Castillo yeah, come and, walking and, in, and it's like a hotel walking montage. <laughs> and I'm thinking Castillo's being smart. See, take her to a hotel, pay in cash, and then there's no paper trail. Her husband would never know. <laughs> That's right. And then they just start looking up for no reason. Can someone explain to me why they were just randomly looking up? Because think- this is before, like, cell phones or even pagers. So it's like no one notified them someone was coming. They just start staring up at the, like, I think our room's over here. <laughs> I, I think the reason why they're looking up because they were like, this looks an awful lot like the hotel from French Twist. <laughs> God, all this looks hmm. so familiar. But they are being watched by someone with binoculars. And by Masek, who's in the elevator writing down, and he sees them, you can see a look on his face already like, son of a bitch. He's like, oh, great. You got him, huh? <laughs> Ex, ex-husband walking around with my wife at a fancy <laughs> hotel. The hell's going on here? <laughs> Dude. Do- did this just turn into a threesome? <laughs> <laughs> May tries to go to her husband, but he waves her off. Says, no, red light. Green yeah. light, Castillo, you like waves them over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because starts going over the rules. So no eye contact, no grabbing <laughs> bareback. They step aside and talk. Moss X says that he didn't want his wife to ask her ex-husband for help, but here we are. And Ma says that his boss told him to deliver a package to Rivas in Ecuador. Didn't know what the package was, but Rivas didn't like it, got angry, and that's why he attacked Ma Sek. And then he also probably there to get revenge with his boss, Malcolm, who's there in Miami. May is watching from a distance and sees the conversation because she's not welcome to come over and part, be part of that conversation for whatever reason. And then the men, Castillo sees the, the, the men are working out. <laughs> Castillo sees some men come running up and Masek just yells out and there becomes a shootout. Gunman just shooting wildly shoots a waiter on the other side of the hotel. Poor waiter. <laughs> Terrible shot. And Masek does what Masek does and runs away. <laughs> Castillo kills one. One gets away. Ma and May are okay. But like you said, Masek has run away. We don't know if he's okay. We just never see him. He's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a quick little... <laughs> Back in the precinct, Castillo shot a guy that works with Rebus. So that's what they found out that the whole team is helping. Stan says that Malcolm owns a shipping import export company called SA Phoenix. And one of Ma- Malcolm's trucks was hit yesterday. And they killed the driver and they stole some stuff. All it was hauling was some toy birds. Okay. So, first thing I noticed about this scene, and we'll come back to the toy birds here, is <laughs> Castillo comes in and, oh no, I'm sorry. The scene starts with Castillo shutting off the projector. What do you guys think on the projector? Was it pictures from the crime scene? Was it pictures of the toy birds? Well, it's a picture of the guy um, that he killed that's on the that's on the screen, right? Isn't that what it was? See, he I shot him. <laughs> it's like a mugshot of the guy that he. That's what when you first go to the scene, it's a mugshot of the guy that he killed, and then he turns off the projector and then he walks around and talks about the guy he shot. <laughs> So the guy, but the guy's like, why do we need him on the projector? Oh, is he just <laughs> bragging? <laughs> okay, okay. What is with these strange toy birds? Have you guys, I've never seen like a toy, is it supposed to be like a toy glass bird? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, can can, uh, can you even give a t- kid a toy glass bird without them breaking it? Like, what do you do with it? If there's one word that sums up this entire episode, it's awkward. Yes, everything is awkward. <laughs> yes. So now Castillo's going to head over to SA Phoenix to go see Malcolm. And they know each other somehow. They're not real clear on what is happening no. in this scene. Well, it's clear that he that he knows him from when he was in Thailand. Because he talks about a restaurant they used to go to. What's the name of that restaurant we used to go to? It's not clear that he's CIA. I thought at first he was just like 
a bad, like he was, you know, one of the bad guys he was like dealing with. Castillo says that Mossack is married to May and that he's her ex-husband and he will do anything to save her. I mean, but you do whatever you want to Mossack, but you leave May out of this. But yeah, because Mossack's an idiot. <laughs> I don't know. I think the CIA guy was doing him a favor. Takes out Mei Ying. That no alimony. I mean, come on, it's his <laughs> ex-wife. You know how many guys would be happy if you killed their ex-wife? <laughs> Back at Castillo's, they're both thinking about Mossack while holding hands. And yeah, he's like, what are you thinking about? Martin's, sex thinking, <laughs> like, I'm thinking, about Martin's thinking about having Thai for dessert. <laughs> and then she says, I'm sorry for thinking about my husband. <laughs> well, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says he talked to Malcolm. And it says, why didn't you tell me that Mossack was CIA? You lied to me. How dare you lie to me? And she said, like, well, you know I couldn't tell you. I didn't tell people what you did when we were married. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sleep together. <laughs> and then he asks her if she still loves her husband. And she says yes. And immediately changes her mind and says, no, actually, I don't. <laughs> And then there's some music. That part's and, not important. <laughs> yeah. There's Let's some start music. talking about <laughs> When they fade to music, just want to give a little insight to where we watch this episode. <laughs> it fades to music and Melissa leans over behind me and whispers in my ear, they did it. <laughs> <laughs> because it was like the music and then the sunrise. And you're like, oh, okay. So they did it. <laughs> and then they come back and she's in, her, she's in a robe and he's like, you look like you belong here. It was gross. It was creepy, right? It was gross. <laughs> It's like knowing your parents yeah, went and then, sex. <laughs> and then Castillo's like, baby, stay here and just do stuff around the house. You know, wash my Speedos, do women's stuff. <laughs> he tries to ask her more information about Mossack, but she says, I don't know anything. But Castillo's really hammered on. Mossack is dirty. He did. He, there's something that he's not telling you here. And he is the reason why you are being hunted, essentially. There's a knock at the door. May goes to get dressed. Castillo leaves. And Trudy is the one that's going to be there to babysit May. And Trudy does a terrible job ahead of time. Let's say that. <laughs> oh, no. Poor Trudy. She So not, not only is Trudy stuck babysitting, but she has to help cook dinner, too. <laughs> well, maybe she wasn't too busy gossiping about how lonely Castillo is. She would have been paying attention. <laughs> She's cutting up all the vegetables, and then Mei Ying just ditches her and takes her damn car. Now who's <laughs> going to finish cooking this duck? <laughs> Poor Trudy stuck there to cook everything. Trudy's got a nice car, too. So, and, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, and very predictably, Mei Ying is no more than five minutes down the street, and she's kidnapped. <laughs> nice job, Trudy. No one nice said job. that Maying was smart, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Did they get her so fast? <laughs> At the precinct the next day or later, I guess, it would be that night, maybe. Chubbs is telling Castillo that they must have nabbed May in broad daylight. Trudy says that it was her fault. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Castillo's just there in <laughs> deep She thought. starts quoting some Donna <laughs> <laughs> Starts quoting some Donna Summer songs. You know? <laughs> I just let her walk right out the door. <laughs> Turn around now. You're not welcome anymore. <laughs> Dad asked if there was a phone call, and Trudy says, yes, it was a wrong number. I thought it was a wrong but number. But of course it was Mossack for the meetup. Casio says it's no luck. He still thinks that Mossack is the dirty one here. He is the key to all of this. Only Ma knows what's going on. Out at Rivas. Rivas comes in. They have May tied up, threatening her with a knife and slapping her around. And of course, Rivas stops. He's like, hey, hey, you're going to get blood all over my floors. Do you know how hard that is to get out? She stands by that she doesn't know anything. She doesn't hasn't talked to anyone. She's done nothing wrong. And Rivas doesn't believe it. He says, Mossack is a thief. I want you to tell me exactly where he is and that you will show me where he is and turns her over to one of his guards, which is probably the same guard that was going to rape her in the beginning. Oh, yeah. It's totally the same guy because it's the same stupid dopey voice. <laughs> <laughs> Out at SA Phoenix, Malcolm comes into his office as he's startled when Castillo is already there. He's been waiting dun, for him. Dun, Ninja dun. interrogation. <laughs> <laughs> which is what Castillo's good at, which is standing in a cat-like state of readiness in the dark. In the dark, yeah. <laughs> yes. This is great, too. And this shows you that the CIA is really scraping the bottom of the barrel these days. <laughs> he said that, too. Um, <laughs> We're like, okay. <laughs> Castillo tortures him with a desk. With a desk <laughs> drawer. 
<laughs> Not my precious hand. Tell me, or I'm going to close this drawer harder. <laughs> it pinched him, okay? It hurt. So let's, <laughs> we find out here that Malcolm knows where Rivas is. It's some CIA deal that they know about kind of what's happening behind the scenes here and what the setup is. But let's make sure we have everything set straight here. As we know as viewers, Mossack is the problem here. He is clearly setting up May to be like a fall person for whatever he's got going on. Now, in the episode so far, we haven't seen him actually do anything wrong. We haven't seen him. Yet, but, uh, but who else was going to know where May was going, how she was going to get captured so fast, how they yeah. knew that she was at Castillo's house. Like, there is no way that they know all that information without Masek giving it up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Back at Rivas, they're still torturing May, and they come back and was clearly like... Ugh, that guy was putting his clothes yeah. back on. It was gross. <laughs> yeah, this was a, a shock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imagine being so disgusting that after the words that she would rather tell them the information than have to sleep with him. Yeah, and I don't think she got a choice on either. Nope. <laughs> no. no. May finally gives up that they're supposed to meet at Warehouse 4 at 7 p.m. They take May out of the room, and Rivas tells the rapist that they... Like what you're saying is that they knew she would give in because he's gross. Well, he is gross. <laughs> yes. Later, the police pull up and they're gonna, they figured out where the Rivas house is from Malcolm. So now they're going to try and get May back when they go in. The house is empty. And mostly you were asking about everyone showing up. Go run in separate cars. Why does everyone <laughs> show up in a separate car? So like Castillo and, and Tub show up together. But Stan has to ride in the bug van by himself. <laughs> the girls show up in a different why is Dan always the odd man out why couldn't he ride in the there was a back seat to the car like no yeah you bring your own van we don't want you riding with us sorry can't go with the cool guys <laughs> you stink man come on <laughs> the extras who were playing the cops they're all like guns up like in the poses like you would like you would think cops would do and here comes the vice crew casually walking to the door, just kind of holding their guns to their side, just slowly walking <laughs> up. At the same time, at a restaurant, Malcolm is having dinner with Mossack and then another man from the CIA. The other man and Mossack don't like each other, but they're there to like just bit basically catch up on business terms exactly what's happening with the rebus scenario we also at the same time have flashbacks where we see mosek is like coating the inside of the glass with a compound probably a poison but he's like getting the glasses ready so that when he pours the drinks he doesn't have to build up an immunity over many many years to the poison that's inside <laughs> of the wine because that would be inconceivable. <laughs> what he did instead was, was poison the only glasses that the other two would drink from, who, when they drink, they immediately die. But what if you mix it up? <laughs> you, like, label it or something on the bottom? Inconceivable, Melissa. <laughs> what if you mix it up? <laughs> he also drinks the wine first. They'd be like, hey, look, it's yeah, all Yeah, and they good. look at each other like, okay, it's all fine. We can drink it. Out at the warehouse. Uh, even, even kills like a wimp. <laughs> exactly. And at the warehouse, poor guard, poor stupid. He was stupid just there guard. doing his job. <laughs> just wait, wait, yeah, he's got nothing to do with this. But you're the guard of the warehouse, and someone knocks on the door. You're like, I guess I'll just go open it. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> I mean, he's not an actual cop. He's just a security guard. So I think you know the most dangerous thing he's got on his little belt there is the the flashlight. They yell out for Mossack, no answer, because they're trying to use May as bait. They look at the manifest from the guard, and they see that a shipment has come in. It's the one that they want to check. So they're going to go over and go do that. Out at the Rivas house, the house is empty, except for Stan says, I need you to come <laughs> into the bathroom. There's some scribbles, some scratches no, not on scribbles, the mirror. Scratches. Yeah. They, they Maybe it's words. I'm not sure. He says they're not words. No, they're, they're not words. They're yeah. scratches. <laughs> And Castillo goes in there and says, Stan, you racist motherfucker. This is Thai. Words. It's Thai language. <laughs> it's just in a different language. It says seven o'clock on it, by the way. <laughs> it's, he says, when he goes in the, into the bathroom, he's like, it's Thai. It says the whatever warehouse at seven o'clock. And then it says the number seven. <laughs> it says seven o'clock. <laughs> yes. Back at the warehouse, they're tearing through all the boxes. They can't find anything. They got lots of birds. <laughs> The mummy's in there somewhere. I I'm sure of it. <laughs> Cortez. See, once again, no. everything's packed in hay. Cortez, who's the rapist. So I was going to refer to him as Cortez. <laughs> He's just the now. rapist. Cortez finds a box uh. that wasn't on the registry. 
They slap the guard who shall not be appearing in this episode any longer, and they haul him away. They didn't ask him about things that hadn't been checked in yet. <laughs> Remus says, whole lot of not my job. Remus says, this is a great day. And Cortez says, please, boss, let me be the one to open the box. My favorite part is Cortez, the way he talks. He's like, yo, I found a box <laughs> over here in the corner. <laughs> And yeah. he's like, can I open it for you? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah go like, ahead and yes, open that yes, box yes, all you want. <laughs> let, let the town idiot open the box. Exactly. like that. <laughs> <laughs> that actually is a good plan. <laughs> the vice team comes charging in just as the box explodes. Who knows why? Because Mossack put a bomb in it. <laughs> you know, because he didn't because care he about would know that they checked the manifest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because he would know that they would check the manifest, then they would search the warehouse and find the only box not on the manifest and open it. Exactly. <laughs> A lot of faith in these pretty stupid bad guys. <laughs> the cops shoot and kill everyone except for Rebus, who gets away. But yeah. Sorry, I, I should I shouldn't say shoot. The sound effects of guns <laughs> they kill happen. everyone <laughs> that is on the <laughs> Rebus gang, including Tubbs' shorty shotgun. Which he pumps like it's shooting, but, but nothing no actually flash shoots. Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but in very, very vice style, they 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 just kill everybody, or they try to, except for Rivas, because he gets away. So we'll probably never see him in the series again. <laughs> Back at the precinct, Tubbs is watching Trudy use a computer. <laughs> My favorite part is him leaning over her shoulder telling her what to do. Um, <laughs> do you not have fingers, Tubbs? <laughs> do you not know how to finger on the key there? <laughs> Don't you know poor Trudy spent all day making dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Castile's for sure that Mossack had an accomplice. When they ask May, she says, oh yeah, it's got to be this guy, Tony Dimitri, who was in the very beginning. Like, they were old buddies, remember? And they find out that he flew into the Bahamas and chartered a boat, but there's been no entry at the ports of that boat. Castillo says, we'll check with the Coast Guard. Maybe he put out an emergency and then they towed him in. Sure enough, that's exactly what he did. Tubbs is like, that's smart. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. I, I got to remember that one in case I want to kill someone who I bet off of death row in the future. <laughs> yeah. May then talks to Castillo and says, I want to help. Don't leave me out of this. You don't know where the meetup is going to happen. You're not going to be able to get an information out of Ma Sec. Let me wear a wire and I will go talk to him. And Stan's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's go for that. Yeah, and he's like, no, you can't do it. <laughs> Back and forth. She ends up doing it. <laughs> so now we're going to go to the docks. The team spreads out. May walks in to see Mossack, and he's surprised, to say the <laughs> Not least. happy, though. <laughs> no. I thought you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> or at this least This is <laughs> <laughs> well, little column A, little column B. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is Vice's favorite tactic, the old bait and trap, you know, because they've had so much success <laughs> using witnesses as bait. She says, you're out of control. He says, I thought they wouldn't hurt you, that you just give up after a little bit of torture. You just yeah. give up a name. And they would just yeah. leave. They would leave you alone. <laughs> After I know that he, I swear, baby, I was coming her. back for you. <laughs> Knowing that, like how it went last time, that they were going to rape her and stuff, and he's like, "No, it's not." They would torture you a little bit, and then you'd give up a name, and then everything would be good. They let you go down and catch up with you later. And she's like, "Bullshit! Uh -huh. That's not what was going to happen. You're out of control, stealing money, and you brought me in on this." And it's like she, she says, "I thought we were a family. Since we stopped being a family when our son died." Which he blamed her because she was driving the car, but it was like a drunk driver hit her or something. Mm -hmm. Then he grabs her, and when he grabs her jacket, opens up, and he sees the wire. Then he gets really mad. You like, went to Castillo, didn't you? You did this for him. And then she starts to choke May. That's when Tubbs comes in. Masek pushes May. He runs off, and then we got a good old-fashioned mano-a-mano karate yes, yes, ending. but... <laughs> <laughs> Let's first just recognize that Ma Sek did, he tried to run away. He tried to do the, Ma, like, his favorite move, run away as soon as he sees Tubbs. So, but then, yeah, Castillo kicks his butt, man. He kicks his butt. His plan works great. Kicks his butt, tells him, you know, she's my woman now. He arrests her. Even when he grabs a board and hits him with a board, he's like, get off me. I can break boards. I'm a ninja. I mean, I guess Masek never saw Bushido. 
not knowing that <laughs> yes. he took a bullet and was still <laughs> able to survive with the exactly. katana around the property. The exactly. A few roundhouse kicks us and he's like, Dano, come on. <laughs> <laughs> And now they have Mossack. They've arrested him. Only the one that's escaped now is Reva. So, but they brought down everything else that comes along with it, including Malcolm. Well, I mean, he's dead. So, <laughs> and so this is where the episode should end, right? He's he's with his wife again. Mossack has been arrested. Unfortunately, Marty Jr. is no longer with us. But oh, we're okay. So everything's be okay. <laughs> and we go to the beach, and Melissa, you mentioned because he's in his casual clothes. <laughs> he's in his casual three piece suit, <laughs> walking around the beach. Yes, like he was. Well, he's I mean, not wearing a speedo. Yeah, I guess. But does the man not own like khaki shorts or something? He could like break out. <laughs> I mean, every man owns a pair of cargo shorts, right? Exactly. Not him though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Castillo and May are walking along the beach. They stare out at the sunset. May turns to her husband and says, I love you, husband. And he says, I love you, wife. And they look at each other for a long time. They kiss. She pulls back, looks at him very sadly, and just walks away. And you're and, like, what the hell are you doing? And then you just see a silhouette of sad Castillo. In his suit. In his suit, standing on the beach, just looking at his feet. Poor, poor Castillo. Just... <laughs> freeze frame of sad Castillo in the sunset. His plan worked so perfectly, too. (laughs) I'm going to introduce a little bit of debate here. This episode ends with her leaving and no mention as to why. She just is. She's just leaving, even though they're perfect and his plan worked out perfect. And he's the best thing that she's going to get and vice versa. Why? Why? Why in this? We just got away. I thought for sure this would set up to be they would stay together, then there would be a second part to this episode in the future where Rivas would come back and he would have to finally kill him. Whoa, but whoa, no. whoa. Finishing <laughs> storylines? Are you crazy? No, we just are left with the mystery of why they couldn't be together. We can't do it. Ooh, I've got a small <laughs> theory about that. <laughs> That's why he wasn't that good at it, I guess. <laughs> I will save that for my final thoughts. All right. Well, let's go talk about this week's music then before we get to the final thoughts. Because it sounds like all of us have lots. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John. This week's music has a band that Melissa is listening to carefully. Yeah, you better better watch yourself. (laughs) She remembers what you said about Morrissey. Yeah, I'm I'm listening. I know my Robert Smith. Don't you talk bad about Robert Smith. I'm surprised you're such a big Joe Cocker fan, but I do (laughs) I'm gonna do him right. Yeah, you know me. Me and Joe Cocker go way back. Okay, so before we go into the big names of the music, because this is a deep, big music, probably the biggest one of the season so far. Uh let's start out with Dark Truths by Joan Armatrading, and you might remember her from the episode Baby Blues. We talked yeah. about her. She's a three-time Grammy nominee. She had a career spanning 46 years in 19 studio albums. She was born on the Caribbean island of St. Kitts and actually started working at the age of 15 for a tool manufacturer, but lost her job for playing guitar during tea breaks. So you guys probably remember that. So we're not going to spend too much time on that because we've got a lot to cover here. Did a pretty long profile in episode Baby Blues. So we're going to move on. Blood Money by The Church. And they are an Australian psychedelic rock band formed in 1980. Their founding members, Steve Kilby on vocals and bass, Peter Copels and Marty Wilson Piper on guitars, Nick Ward was on drums, for the debut album only, then was replaced by Richard Plug for all of the 80s, followed then by Jay Dodderly and Tim Powers from the 90s on. Their first album produced the radio hit The Unguarded Moment, and they were signed to an Australian, European, and U.S. labels. But their second album, their U.S. label, was dissatisfied and ended up dropping them. Without releasing the album, they would still see success in Australia and in England and returned to the charts in 88, the top 40 hit under the Milky Way. The church has found mainstream success that has proven a little elusive, but they've retained a really large international cult following. And so, and I mean, even as of 2010, they're continuing the tour. Uh, they're releasing their 25th studio album, uh, Man, Woman, Life, Death, 
Infinity. It was released in October of 2017. And that's a theme today, because, I mean, we started out with 19 albums. They're on their 25th album. We're going to go more in-depth on The Church when they reappear in the episode Asian Cut, which I believe is episode 7 of this season. Our next song is The One by Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker also had the song Many Rivers to Cross, which appeared in The Prodigal Son back way back in season 1. But that was before I was doing my music segment, guys. (laughs) So I feel like we kind of got to talk about him. Because I I can't just throw people back, hey, go check out that episode that I didn't talk about him. He's an English rock and blues singer and musician. He's known for his gritty voice and distinct versions of popular songs. In 1960, along with three friends, he formed the group The Cavaliers. It would break up a year later and Cocker would leave the band to pursue a career as an apprentice gas fitter while continuing to to break into music. Joe Cocker, his biography, basically at any point in like the first 10 years of his career, he could have quit at any time and said, F it, I'm going to go be a pipe fitter. You know, this just isn't working out because he goes quite a long time before things actually catch traction. While working as an apprentice gas fitter, He would then, in 61, under the stage name Vance Arnold, form the Vance Arnold and the Avengers. That's when he would first develop his love of the blues, and they would mostly play pubs, covering Ray Charles and Chuck Chuck Berry's songs. In 64, get his first record contract as a solo artist, and not a member of Vance Arnold and the Avengers. His first release would be a cover of the Beatles song, I'll cry instead. But despite extensive promotion, the record would flop, leading Cocker to drop the stage name and form the Joe Cocker Blues Band. There is only one recording from the Joe Cocker Blues Band yeah. in existence. <laughs> he would take a one year hiatus from music uh, after that because, yeah, things are out quite well. He would team up after that with Chris uh, Satan to form the Grease Band, which, by the way, guys, I always love the previous band names of people <laughs> that I do in my music segments. The Grease Band is definitely, they're definitely going to be up there. And this is when things start to get fun. Because the Grease Band, but they would catch the, the attention of record producer Denny Cordell. He would bring Cocker and Jeff Cocker in, uh, without the band in and record song, the single Margarine. Cocker and Stanton would actually then dissolve the band, move to London to work with Denny, and then they would bring in a guy named Tommy Iyer on keyboards to make up the new Grease Band. So essentially... They told their old band, like, hey, uh, peace out, guys. Moved to England and just hired a whole new band. (laughs) Cocker would eventually hit the big time of another Beatles song he would cover. He would do a rearrangement of With a Little Help of My Friends that would actually reach number one in the UK in 1968. And it would also later be used as the theme to The Wonder Years. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I was like, I recognize the name. I know Joe Cocker, obviously. I recognize the name of the song. But mm-hmm. I just couldn't place it in my head. Not yet. I'm like, okay, I know exactly. By the way, that arrangement of that Beatles cover also featured Jimmy Page on lead guitar. Really? Yeah. So this was actually, this really did shoot him into the big time. Danny would be able to get them in and they would play Woodstock in 69. And then directly after Woodstock, Cocker would release his, and I, I emphasize his second album, Joe Cocker. <laughs> bye bye, Grease Band. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, and impressed by his cover, McCartney and George Harrison would allow Cocker on the, his second album to cover two more Beatles songs, Something and She Came Through the Bathroom Window, which would help the album achieve number 11 in the U.S. So he would continue to tour, he would do variety shows like Ed Sullivan, and he would even tour the U.S., but after the U.S. tour, he was tired, he actually dissolved the Grease Band, who I guess, who they were actually playing as his backup band. It's like, guys, I don't need you anymore, we're gonna take a break, but after he would dissolve the band, he would be, he would learn that he was contractually obligated to once again tour the U.S., <laughs> So he would quickly form 
a new band called Mad Dogs and Englishmen with over 20 musicians, and they would <laughs> tour 48 cities, kind of leaving the old guys in the dust, huh? It, it, it record a live album, but eventually exhaustion and just personal conflicts would lead to Cocker being depressed. He would drink heavily as the tour wound down in 1970. In 72, they would tour Australia, and then he and six, six of the members would be arrested for pot. And three days later, he would be arrested for assault after a oh. brawl at their hotel, leading to Australian federal police giving them 48 hours to leave the country. <laughs> after that tour, Staten would retire from music to go start his own label. Uh, Cocker would become estranged from longtime producer Cordell. He would sink into a depression and for about a year actually used heroin, but kicked the habit basically by trading the needle for the bottle. Just continued down a path of rock star destruction. He would be recording albums and actually in 73 he would record his probably most famous song off the album i can stand a little rain uh, a cover of billy preston's you are so beautiful which would hit number five long and number 11 album on u.s charts but yeah just throughout the 70s just rock star fame and rock star partying he he did snl in 76 and at the time when he did snl he was eight hundred thousand dollars in debt to his record mm. label a and m mm. but luckily it is, he would meet producer Michael Lang, who would only agree to work with him if he sobered up and stayed sober. He would hit the 80s, continue to record and tour sober, but he would see a decline in his popularity, and he would also get into reggae for some reason. <laughs> it just continued success. I mean, he would he would put on the first concerts in the German Democratic Republic and East Berlin. He would play presidential inaugurations like George Bush Sr.'s inauguration. And he was still performing all the way up until 2012. And then, sadly, Cocker died from lung cancer in December of 2014. He was 70 years old, and he had smoked 40 cigarettes a day since since about 1991. <laughs> so, which obviously can lead to his gritty voice. Yeah, he that took a path on Joe Cocker I didn't know about. Like that whole hard lifestyle that he chose to live. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the song The Kiss by some band called The Cure. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the opposite of Joe Cocker and the story that you just told about Joe Cocker, The Cure was the original straight edge. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there was this guy, Robert Smith. They released a couple albums. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> a couple albums. And where emo came from. Think. <laughs> no, okay. So The Cure is made up of Robert Smith on guitar and vocals, uh, or originally was made up of Robert Smith on guitar and vocals. Paul Thompson, I have no idea if I'm saying that right. Yeah, that's right. On guitar. Michael Dempsey on bass. Lal Hullhurst on drums. Uh, they were formed in 1976 and have experienced a number of lineup changes over the years. So bear with me, guys. I'm not going to mention all of them. <laughs> because you just don't get recognized. The, Robert Smith is pretty much the cure, and we're just gonna we just accept that people change, but Robert <laughs> Smith stays the same. The founding members actually met his friends at Notre Dame Middle School in Crowley, Sussex. Their first performance was literally the end of the year show in 1973. <laughs> By the way, they were named the their band name Obelisk. <laughs> awesome, right? So cool. Don't you just love the pre-famous band names? <laughs> so in 1976, while attending St. Wilfred's Comprehension School, a comprehensive school, they formed a five-piece band, this time called Malice. And they would perform <laughs> a bunch of Jimi Hendrix and David Bowie covers. There are only three documented shows, by the way, of the band Malice. So by 77, they were starting to get into punk, you know. I mean, you got to think about it. They were probably, what, seniors in high school in 77? Starting to get into punk rock. Lineup changes continued, which also prompted a name change to the band. Obviously, Malice wasn't working out, so <laughs> they went with the band name Easy Cure. <laughs> they also hired and fired, very quickly, a front man known as Gary X. We are unaware of what happened to Gary X afterwards. <laughs> Is he still alive? <laughs> 
We, we, we don't know if Gary X was just a name to protect his identity. They would move on from Gar- after they fired Gary X, and they would hire Peter O'Toole. Not the actor, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, that would be... <laughs> they would have their first live performance as Easy Cure, and they would enter and win a talent contest, winning a record contract with the German label Areola Hansa. <laughs> O'Toole would then leave the band. This is fantastic. O'Toole would leave the band to go live in a kibbutz. Uh, kibbutz. Kibbutz. By the way, I had to look up what that was, and that is basically the Israeli version of a utopian commune. <laughs> he joined a cult. He joined a cult, guys. In <laughs> literally a cult in Israel. Like, like the. Okay. <laughs> so they would audition. They would audition for a new band. And I would love to know. I, I haven't read any full-on biographies by any of them, but I would love to know if at the audition, if Gary X showed up again. <laughs> like, Come on, guys. I me back. <laughs> So, but ultimately, Robert Smith, uh, they wouldn't hire anyone. Robert Smith would just take over on vocals. So they would start recording demos, and they would win another talent contest, winning them another record contract, this time with German label, just, German label, just Hansa. German record labels might so, be better than previous band names. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They never released anything. Part of the reason they never released anything was that the label refused to release their first potential album, which they had named Killing an Arab. (laughs) The record label would go, hey, you know, instead, why don't we just do an album with some covers? They said, no, no, we're not doing any cover albums or anything. So in 1978, their contract was dissolved, and they were back to square one. So there's actually nothing. There's never nothing was ever really released of the Easy Cure until later. Bootlegs were made available. They would play their last gig in '78, and the Cure was born once again. The Cure was born through some changes in the band's personnel, and they would start sending out a bunch of demos. And by the end of '78, a guy named Chris Perry, who had just formed his own label called Fiction, he would sign them and release their single, Killing an Arab. Actually, it blew up. Some people thought it was genius. Other people thought it was the most racist thing. Literally, the band's answer to the calls of them of racism was to put a sticker over the word Arab. (laughs) But it worked. Fiction would release their first debut album, Three Imaginary Boys. Pretty good reviews, you know, aside from the calls of racism. And that would include their second single, Boys Don't Cry. They would do lots of touring. And actually, Robert Smith would be doing double duty during touring, as every night he would perform with The Cure, and then he would fill in as the lead guitarist of... Susie and the Banshees hmm. replacing their their guitarist John John McKay and that he actually continued to play with them and record with them throughout uh, for a long time. So as of their second album, one of the things that happened during their first album was the label didn't think that they were experienced enough, so they brought someone in to kind of oversee everything. So by the second album, Robert Smith wanted more control. They had a couple more lineup changes. There was a side project under the name Cult Hero at the same time. The second album, 17 Seconds, would see more creative control for the band. And it would reach number 20 on UK charts. And it would just, con- they would continue to be- it more- build their popularity from there. Third album, Faith, would, see- would make number 14. And pretty much after the third album, by about 1983, Pari would start to get worried about some uh, internal issues in the band. So he pitched an idea that they should kind of reinvent themselves. So they had already established their, tradi- their- what they're known for, their gothic look and their sound and so they actually kind of did reinvent themselves they went a little bit more pop up ish and uh i think at first uh robert smith really had the idea of like well i don't give a crap mostly because he was still recording with the banshees he was still doing stuff with them (laughs) they would continue recording and 1987's double lp kiss me kiss me kiss me would bob would be about the peak of their success or at least their most successful album 
and song because it would include Just Like Heaven, which would be their first top 40 hit in the U.S. and help them achieve worldwide success. It would move into the 90s, continue, continuing to hire and fire different band members for different reasons, some <laughs> for trashing hotel rooms, others for problems with, with alcohol. But out with the old, in with the, they would keep going. And actually, the 90s was a period of transition in that they they did a lot more commercial stuff. They did the song Burn for 1994's movie The Crow. They did Dread Song, which is the theme song for the 95 Judge Dread with no uh, way. Sly Stallone. Yeah. No way. That, mm-hmm. that, they do they, that title yes. song? Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, a bunch of sellouts. You, uh, hey. <laughs> They would also contribute to the soundtracks for movies X-Files in 98 and American Psycho in 2000. And pretty much since the 2000s, they've done the Greatest Hits albums. They've done touring, released other albums. Even though, like, every five years, Robert Smith comes out and says, I think think the band's almost dead. Almost done. (laughs) I'm never going to release anything again. Uh, They they played their 40th anniversary show in 2018. They have a new album that's supposed to drop in 2019. Still going. Every single person in the music had careers that been multiple decades i have three things that i'll mention about the cure one i didn't realize that boys don't cry was so early yeah it was and, very it was early like, their first album is where boys don't cry come from like, okay two as robert smith is age he looks more and more like my grandma every day hey with the crazy hair and the <laughs> <extra> thick makeup <laughs> and three and i'm gonna out melissa on this the greatest moment in your musical life is <laughs> going to see them in concert <laughs> when we saw them at the curiosa festival in san francisco yep we were there from like 8 a.m mm-hmm. and they didn't come on until like 10 o'clock at night we yeah saw a whole bunch of other crap bands yep we did <laughs> and then we saw did the banshees here. perform <laughs> no the banshees were not there <laughs> we saw lots of bands that weren't big yet, oh. that became big later like muse uh-huh yes that was one of them. Yep. Oh. So there, Alyssa. Did I do them justice? Yes, you did. I didn't did. talk all kinds of smack. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm so I, I, I didn't make fun of them. I, I, I did. A- I, I was a lot nicer to them than I was to Morrissey. Yeah, uh, exactly. Come on, you have to at least admit that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Poor Morrissey. <laughs> so fragile. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode because I feel like there's like a volcano building here where some people <laughs> got to get some stuff off their chest you. <laughs> about this episode. Yeah, Let's go him. give our final <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Okay, no surprise. I am starting this week's... <laughs> He's ready. He's fired up. <laughs> this week's final thoughts. <laughs> and I've mentioned several times that when I go first, it's because I'm angry about something. <laughs> I love this episode. This is a great episode. And when we first started getting Castillo heavy episodes, like in the Golden Triangle, I was like, eh, they're okay. You they're were like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Most of them say constantly... Castillo episodes are the best episodes. At the end of this episode, it's true. Castillo episodes are the best episodes. Why? Because they're always outside of the box. The best episodes are always either A, Trudy, or B, Castillo, because they're always something different. They bring something different to the table. They're very complex stories. Castillo stories are always very complex, very layered, nuanced. There's lots of different moving pieces that are all happening at the exact same time. So Castillo stories are fantastic, and this should have been a two-part episode. And they have done two-part episodes with less than what is in this one because Revis was being hunted by the CIA. He was robbed by the CIA. He escaped, and he also attempted to murder Castillo's wife. There is every reason why there should be a follow-up episode to this story. But instead, we get May leaving and a sad Castillo at the end. Here's my conspiracy theory on this. Let's fry up some conspiracy bacon. (laughs) I have it sizzling away over here about what I think is happening. I think this is indicative of what we're going to get in season five. And this frustration is always going to be there because they can't promise to the viewer that there's going to be a second episode. This is the last season. They can't say, hey, next season, you never know. Reva's going to make a comeback. Like, no, this is it. It was known. Season five was the last season. Them ending it this way, I'm going to do a complete 180 here surprise fooled you all this is the way this episode had to end they had to give an ending to it for the fans or for the fans that are watching it to, to tell them don't worry this episode is complete we're not going to leave you hanging yes we did leave you hanging a little bit 
but we didn't just end it with like him in a relationship and then never mention it for the rest of the season. We had to end this very hastily, but for the right reasons, because you're never going to get another shot at this story. John, what are your final thoughts? I think it is a fantastic episode. Guess what, guys? We had a good Vice episode without Crockett. (laughs) <laughs> he was hardly in it at all at all it, proof miami vice could have existed without don johnson so and unlike unlike some of the other co episodes we got full involvement from everybody else we got stan we got the ladies we got full involvement with everything we got a good story we and it's very castillo the story was a little awkward castillo's a little awkward <laughs> we got the uh badass mysterious castillo scenes and uh we got the slightly confusing other scenes you know but it was <laughs> it was a it, it was a great episode and a fantastic castillo episode without Sonny Crockett. Hmm. <laughs> Jump on the conspiracy wagon. What bugs me at the end is with Castillo and his wife when she just walks away. And I see what you're saying, Dom. But I have another theory. I remember them actually showing us them recovering the money that Mei Mi- Ying's husband stole. Mm. I don't know what happened to that money. We, we, we see them catch Mossack. We see them deal with Rivas. But Re- just didn't find the money. Mei Ying's husband didn't bring the money to the job. Obviously, that would be stupid. She does remember that she does try and talk to him about, you know, I thought we were a family of being a partner. Uh, what if she leaving Castillo because she knows where the money is? <laughs> Mei Ying is starting her new life on some Caribbean island with whatever that money was from the CIA that she stole. And she's getting away scot-free because <laughs> Castillo fell hook, line, and sink because she took care of the old hubby, you know, the weenie (laughs) boy, and took care of Revis, and now she gets away scot-free. She's going to go run off with the money and leave poor old Castillo there with a broken heart and no idea that she used them the whole time. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I don't like this episode. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love this episode. I love it, but I'm so sad at the end of it, obviously, because I want Castillo to get I would like for somebody on the show, just one person on the show to like end up with with what they want to end up with, which is like in a relationship and to have like someone who they can go home to. And I feel very sad that he's in that giant empty house by himself thinking about how she was going to make him food and wearing a robe and now she, how she looks so good being there. Like she was meant to be there. Uh, Obviously this is like a long time bone to pick with the show that they never told you. You never get to know why she left. Like, is it because she just doesn't think it's going to work? Is it because she's not safe because Rebus might come back for her? Is it because, yeah, like John said, she's got the money. She's taken off. I think it was supposed to be insinuated that they found the money when they found Mock or whatever. And they, yeah, I mean, mean, I (laughs) That's what it's supposed to be. Like he had the money with him and he was going to take it and then they were going to go. But obviously it's very frustrating, but it is a closure of some sort. So at least I at least have to say I got that, that she'll, we know that, you know, she's not disappeared. She, her, her kid's dead, but she's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was shocking. But like I said, I've always wanted to know why. Like, why did, why couldn't they be together? One thing is for sure that I think we all agree on is that the ending is so crushing that he's yes. just there broken hearted with the only woman he's ever cared about and she's leaving for some unknown reason and there is castillo with his head buried in his chest and his hands in his pocket everyone everyone on this planet should be trying to hunt down <laughs> maying and ex- exact revenge for what <laughs> she has done to dad yes exactly because i will he, tell he you he doesn't want anybody I, but her that's why he never goes out with anybody or does anything he just wants her. I will tell you, I am going to give her a talking to the next the next Comic-Con she's at. <laughs> uh, you know, because she's got to those things. All the Star Trek people do. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. I know I say that every time when we get to the end of the episode. But I'm not playing anymore. We want to hear from you. <laughs> Email us, heat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Go With The Heat. Instagram at Go With The Heat. Where else are you going to look for us? You can just yell out into someone's home. Alexa, <laughs> email Go With The Heat. <laughs> and Gary, F, if you are out there, join me. We will start a band and we will show Robert, uh, Robert Smith what he is missing. <laughs>
<laughs> Me and you, buddy. Hurry, X, and come on, baby. We're going to rock them. Just a reminder, we do want to hear from you, too, about how we should finish watching this show, Lost Episodes, before Freefall or after Freefall, as they aired or the order in which they were filmed. Let us know. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the show notes and more. You can also find out the ways to support us. Support step number one. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Support step number two. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and give us five stars. No one ever reads the reviews. Just give us five stars, and then in the review, write your fan fiction about how Gary X would have made the cure better. Uh, what? <laughs> yes. Don't write that. <laughs> yes. We won't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Support step number three. Check out that Patreon. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. Believe it or not, pals. Miami Vice is coming to an end, and we have plans for what we want to do for the next show and the future of this podcast. Go check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat and see the ways that the direction we want to take the show. You want us to do 21 Jump Street? You got to vote. You got to go out there and vote and let us know if you want us to do 21 Jump Street. Alien Nation, I think we're listening. Something with a WWE wrestler in it. We might be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Go to that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. Let us know where you stand. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. There's got to be an 80s show that's got a uh, WWE wrestler as the main character, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Probably I mean, one with on, Macho Man. There's got to be one. <laughs> Probably one with Macho Man R- R- Randy Savage music in it. Oh, my God. <laughs> my perfect friend. <laughs> <laughs>